light as possible, right? All of you have already got jobs and uh, everything. Now you are on a mood. Yes. <laughs> no problem. So how is your routine? Is it possible for me to adjust this class somewhere uh, else? Like a little bit earlier or some other day? Like 2.30 or 3.30? 4.30 is a very odd time. Or you have other classes, full packed. Karun Duto, different areas. Mechanical, from mechanical engineering, uh, what are the options you have for uh, in order to actually schedule this class somewhere else? Oh. Mechanical engineering, anyone? Yes, Ma'am, uh, like if we just like discuss amongst ourselves and then let you know by today night will be fine. Ma yeah, that will be really great. I. Uh, I mean, if you are having difficulties or if you face difficulties, there is no issue. I I, I mean, I can take the class uh, as scheduled because uh, I understand that this class will be on online mode and now you have to come to campus for your classes, right? So that will be offline mode. So uh, probably that will be a bit difficult if it is stays 4.30 at 4.30, it will be easier for you to attend the classes. But just discuss if it is possible, like uh, someday around 2.30 or 3.30, that will be really good. Okay, okay. Good. But uh, Wednesday, Friday, I can't be available from 2.30 onwards, okay? Because uh, I have labs. Even in the mornings, I mean, I'm fine okay. with that. I have classes on Monday, uh, 11 to 1, Wednesday, 11 to almost 1. Uh, so other than that, I'm free. If nothing works out, we will stay as it is. Okay. Okay, I think I need to switch off the video because already the connection is bad at the university. Let me just put it into Okay, I think it's uh, already 5 past 4.30, so we will start the class for today. Uh, so good afternoon, all of you, and welcome to the open elective course on colloid and surface engineering. Uh, already you have your first class on Saturday, I guess, with uh, Dr. Shashwata Bosch, uh, who has started probably the module one. Uh, if you look at the syllabus, I will start from module three, but I will not cover everything at the beginning of module three. So I will start with the nanomaterials. We will complete this portion of nanomaterials, their preparation, lithographic techniques and applications. And then we will move to uh, module two, where basically the, all the forces and the surface properties comes into play. But uh, once, uh, probably by that time, and up to uh, until when I finish this uh, nanomaterials preparation lithographic techniques, uh, Dr. Bosch will uh, cover the, uh, hopefully will cover the module one so that it will be easier for you to understand module two, what is happening over there. 
Now, uh, this is uh, my phone number and uh, email ID. If you have any difficulties at any time, you can contact me. And if you want to come and see me for any of the doubts, uh, this is my room number in chemical engineering department. And uh, you can come on Monday, 2.30 to 3.30, when I'm available up to 5.30. But uh, usually, uh, there are other people probably will come for the project. So that's why. So uh, that is a bit of introduction about the about me. And uh, now we will actually move to uh, the module three, where we will be talking about nanomaterials, preparation, lithographic techniques, and application. In, in today's class, what I will do is I will just try to give you an overview about nanomaterials. We will not talk much about uh, the preparation, lithographic technique, applications. Applications, although I will talk a bit in brief, but we will discuss uh, the applications in detail in uh, later classes. But for this, I will probably take uh, three classes and I will finish it off. Okay. And uh, like every course, uh, every topic, we do have some objectives. So after you just complete this module in this portion of the module, you can have an understanding about uh, nanomaterials, their structures and origins. You can have, we will also have a brief idea about the properties of nanomaterials arising from their size effect, uh, getting conversant with a bit of nanolithographic techniques, um, I mean, photolithographic techniques, and we will talk mostly about uh, other like electron beam epitaxy or, or, or other kind of uh, sol gel material preparations, uh, like nanomaterial fabrication techniques. We will talk about all those techniques a little in brief, other than photolithography. Uh, then, uh, obviously, we will talk uh, about more detail about uh, uh, applications area, uh, where, I mean, applications means in today's world, all of you know that it is everywhere, right? Uh, it's, there is no corner where you can touch your hand with your hand, uh, you find an application of nanotechnology or nanomaterials. So, uh, I mean, we will talk about it and you will see, I will try to get some uh, application oriented towards uh, mechanical engineering as well as uh, uh, instrumentation and uh, electronics engineering, because there are, I mean, every, every sector, we do have a lot of, whole lot of applications. We will talk about a bit about semiconductors and then we will also talk about uh, uh, application in the field of automobiles that will probably give you some insights about the, uh, you know, the wideness of application of nanomaterials. Now, obviously, before going to uh, what is nanomaterial and uh, uh, what happens with the nanomaterials, uh, what are the properties, let us just go back a bit, okay? So we will actually, the first nanomaterial or nanotechnology talks that come around uh, in 1959 by Richard Feynman, and you all of you probably know that, uh, 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 in his famous talk, there is plenty of room at the bottom uh, at Caltech uh, in an American Physical Society meeting. He actually mentioned a uh, uh, lot of things which are basically the building blocks of uh, today's nanotechnology, which he, whatever he visioned is what happened. Some of our friends waiting. No one is waiting. I cannot see anyone. Ask them to try again, please. Ma'am, I have entered, ma'am. Okay. No, actually, because I'm in university and uh, we do actually, so sometimes we get uh, disturbed with the internet connection. So I, I'm not sure, I was not sure about it. So that's what. Uh. 
Okay. So, uh, there was a famous talk basically by Richard Feynman and uh, in that talk, this is, let me just go through these uh, words actually. These are very, very, you know, interesting as well as at the same time it is informative. And that is where the onset of nanotechnology or vision of the nanotechnology started. I would not say onset because uh, we already have plenty of applications, although the nanotechnology or nanomaterials term didn't coin before 1974, uh, but uh, we de do have a lot of applications before that, uh, although people were not aware of the sizes of the material. Okay, so uh, in, in his famous talk in 1959, Richard Feynman said that what I want to talk about is a problem of manipulating and controlling things on a small scale. What are the limitations as to how small a thing has to be before you can no longer mold it. How many times when you are working on something frustratingly tiny, like your wife's wristwatch, have you said to yourself, if I could only train an ant to do this? What I would like to suggest is the possibility of training an ant to train a mite to do this. A friend of mine who he refers as Albert R. Hibbs, suggests a very interesting possibility for relatively small machines. He says that although it is a very wild idea, it would be interesting in surgery if you could swallow a surgeon. You put the mechanical surgeon inside the blood vessel and it goes into the heart and looks around. It finds out which valve is the faulty one and takes a little knife and slices, slices it out. You can imagine it was 1959. Whatever they said, it looks like sci-fi movies, but actually in today's world, we have attained all of this. We not only be able to wristwatch you know, machining or wristwatch uh, uh, repairing, we have done it long before. But in the last decade, we were able to actually send uh, robot doctors into our blood vessels, and they can actually do the uh, the uh, operation. Okay, and that is the power of vision. So in more than 60 years ago, what Richard Feynman has visioned, uh, we were like, as a community, a scientist community, we were able to, or a scientist and engineers community, we are able to actually achieve that. But in 1960, although this talk came up, uh, it was still a bit unknown to the, uh, to the scientific world about the world nanotechnology. Uh, in 1974, if I'm not completely wrong, in 1974 probably, uh, uh, the first term that is uh, basically that nanotechnology term by Norio Taniguchi, who is a Japanese scientist, uh, basically coined this nanotechnology term. And uh, although he coined the term, but in 1981, K.E. Drexler, basically, uh, he actually come up with nanomaterial or, I mean, usually uh, engines of creations, if you, if you, if you, if you uh, know that, okay? He wrote a book, Engines of Creation, and that basically envisioned the uh, today's nanotechnology world or uh, nanotechnology, uh, nanomaterials, nano, uh, whatever nano you, you heard about, because nano is a new buzzword in the scientific community. In the last 20 years, if you look at Google, if you search in Google, you will find there are so many advances and the advancement is so fast in terms of technology, in terms of materials that we are talking about. Obviously, when you look at the term nano, uh, that basically derives from the Greek word known as a uh, Greek word dwarf. 
Okay. I think I do have, yeah. Okay. So the first, this is basically came up from the Greek word known as a uh, Greek word dwarf. Dwarf means nothing but billionth of something. They were, they used this term long before. And uh, before the nanotechnology or uh, nanomaterials comes into play. So from that, basically, the nanomaterials or nanometer or nano, uh, uh, you know, uh, idea about nano came up. So nanomaterials are materials having dimensions of around 10 to 100 nanometers, okay? Sometimes people actually goes around 1000 nanometers also, but it is usually a couple of 10, uh, I mean, one to one nanometer up until 100 to 200 nanometers is a range where we consider that material as nanomaterial in the length scales, one of the length scale. If you are considering three dimensional material, then either X, Y or Z ha has to be in that length scale. Now, if you consider one nanometer, which is basically, uh, you know, uh, 10 to the minus 9 nanometer, 9 meter, actually, in terms of meter, if you are putting um, uh, putting about, and this is the normal, uh, I mean, you have to put 8 digit before 1 meter, before 1, in order to go to nanometer. But uh, when we talk about the nanometer range, usually it is, you cannot see it, like, if you with normalize, obviously you can see it with uh, with these. Uh, uh, I mean uh, the analytical instruments, uh, advanced analytical instruments, but you cannot see it in your uh, normal eye. Usually, the most of the research basically uh, focused on the transition of properties from the solid state to the atoms, uh, and uh, why this is so. We will talk about it, and they do have different chemical and physical properties like electrical conductivity, chemical reactivity, optical properties. All these things are different when we are talking about the nanomaterial range. Okay, and uh, but as I was mentioning, let me just go back again a bit uh, before. Uh, although uh, in 1980, 1970, the term nanomaterials or nanotechnology comes into play way before that, way before that. Uh, if you just go ahead with, I mean, go back in the in the in the Roman Emperor centuries or or even before that, you will find a lot of medieval European region, uh, European uh, ages. Then you will find there are applications of nanomaterials. You can have you seen uh, like uh, uh, you know colored glasses like red glasses or uh, things like that. In, in in if you go to European cities, you will see in the churches most of them are beautifully decorated and they are almost all of them are colored. Those red colored uh, uh, are basically uh, derived by, uh, you know, uh, gold nanoparticles actually fused into the glass. That is how they get that red color. And uh, there was, uh, I mean, we also heard about that famous uh, experiment by Faraday in 18, I think, 1886 or 40, uh, 80, yeah, around 1886 uh, with gold uh nanoparticles so there are a lot of applications there uh, there were all, all i mean even uh, there was uh, reinforced carbon nano carbon nanomaterials into tires for you know the stiffness of the tires almost 100 years now uh, was there so there are plenty of applications already available in uh, you know uh, humankind but uh, only thing is, we didn't understand that it was a size that actually give us that um, extra properties that we can modulate and we can use it for our benefit. That has been actually started only after 1980s. So that is the basically uh, takeaway from, from, from it.
Okay, now look at the length scale because we have already talked about what is uh, nanomaterial or how nanomaterial does look like. So if you, uh, Richard Feynman actually talked about the ant. Ant is still at five millimeter, around five millimeter, two to three to five millimeter. Ants are of, in that length scale. If you look at the dust mite, it is around 200 micrometers. Uh, if you talk about the human hair that I was talking about, which we can see, it is still in the 60 to 120 micrometer range. Then if you go ahead and talk about the red blood cells, RBCs, then it is around seven to eight micrometer range, okay? Uh, tip of a head of a pin, it is one to two millimeter. Uh, then um, uh, I'm not coming into these things later on. Uh, if you go to DNA, but if you go to DNA, what happens? DNA is around two to 12 nanometer diameter. Okay. So they are nanometer range. So you cannot see it by, uh, by naked eye. You have to have a certain special instrument to look for these kind of materials. Now, the classic example, classical example, basically, for any nanotechnology operation, if you find it from the nature, is photosynthesis, okay? And if the ATP synthesis, if you look at this, it is around the range of 10 nanometer in diameter. Now, you have to understand something. Whenever we talk about the nanotechnology, uh, the basic thing already been is like that. Already we have the materials. We have in the bulk form. Uh, sometimes we have we do have in the micro range form as well. But what in the nanotechnology era we are doing is we are trying to get most of the benefits out of this nano size of these materials which is already available on earth now we with the nanotechnology if you look at the application most of the time you will find that it is trying to mimic the nature we are trying to mimic the nature in nature everything is available okay so that is why it is very important that is why actually it is almost uh imperative whenever we talk about nanotechnology or nanomaterials we talk about an interdisciplinary approach it's not about chemical engineering it's not about mechanical engineering it's not about electronics engineering it's not about instrumentation it's about the idea or approach you tackle with this size range okay question you can stop me anywhere although these are a bit at the beginning these are all bit uh, uh, you know uh, descriptive but still if you have any doubts or any questions you can stop me anywhere uh, so this is uh, another length scale uh, so if you look at the at humans so basically <coughs> I don't know it's three to uh can anyone tell me what is this figure no, basically two meter meter two meter one two three yes, two meter not uh, two meter yes, two meter then this one is uh, one m zero one m zero one 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 m one millimeter. One millimeter. One millimeter. One millimeter. Because that's, that is a pinhead. Okay. So this is pinhead. Now biological like uh, red uh, RBCs and everything, it comes around more than thousand nanometers. So they are mostly in the micrometer range. Okay. Now, if you talk about the DNAs, uh, which we have already talked about, it is around two point five nanometers and all. And if we are talking about the individual atoms, which are mostly less than one nanometer, these are mostly around 56 nanometer, 56 angstrom and so on. Uh, so that's how you, it basically is. Okay. So this is how basically, if you are talking about the size range, this is how we are looking at. Uh, now, what happens with this size range? Obviously, we talked about the length scale and everything is fine. What happens to that? does really size matters yes it is what happens suppose you take we will just do a small brainstorming over here you take a one centimeter cube 
okay what will be the surface area of this one cent centimeter cube uh, uh, material six centimeter square right centimeter it has six square. faces so it will be six centimeter square now if you take a uh, one millimeter cube and you try to fill this whole area of this you know uh, this one centimeter cube uh, cube then what will happen how many how many uh, cubes you need for that can anyone tell me and what will be the surface area although the surface area given over here but can anyone just relate to it how many I'm cubes you will be needing thousand cubes thousand cubes thousand cubes then what will be the surface area of each one of them ma'am uh, uh, 6 mm square okay so the total surface area will become 60 cm square now do the same thing with 1 nanometer cube with 1 nanometer cube how many <laughs> Ma'am, a lot, ma'am. A lot. Yes, yes. A huge number. Bolana, Kotta, Moralis. Ma'am, Trillium. Sam, can do about 21 round. Yes, around? Ten to the part twenty-one. Ten to the part twenty-one. Ma'am, how many number? No, of not cubes? ten to the power twenty-one, but uh, what I found ten to the power eighteen. Was it correct, or am I wrong? I might be. Ma'am, how many number of cubes? Ten to the power eighteen, not ten to the power twenty-one. Quarter. Ma'am, it should be, I think, 10 to the power 21. 21, nah? finally. Yeah, okay. So, 10 to the power 21. And then, what is the, uh, in terms of the surface area, how, how, how what will be the surface area? For each cube? One nanometer square, right? Okay. Six into one. I mean, there are six faces. Six nanometer square, right? Uh, that so, total will be six into ten to the power twenty-one hours. Surface here. Uh, sorry, ma'am. मतलब each cube का है each cube का six होगा मतलब six nanometer square. Yeah. Yeah. Six nanometer square. Okay. So if you put it in terms of centimeter square, what will be the total number? Because you said there will be 10 to the power 21 number of cubes. And six nanometer square is the area of each cube. So what will be the total area? Nanometer three, six. Anyway, you can do this. This this will be yes, ma'am. Uh, right, uh, it is. Uh, um, yes. Sixteen. Ma'am, the number is right. Sixteen to ten to the power six. 
फुटबल ग्राउंड You can imagine the area that we can generate with. Ma'am, it will be tiny... more than sixty meters square. It will be more than. Yes, ma'am. It will be six thousand meters. Square. Yes, ma'am. Probably six into ten to the three meters square. Ah, oh, it will be six thousand. Six thousand meters. Six thousand. Six thousand. Six thousand meters. Six thousand. Six thousand meters. Yeah, it, it's centimeter square. So four. Yeah, so six thousand meter square. So it you can imagine it. It is uh, I mean more than a football size ground. A football ground actually size of a football ground. So you can imagine the area that we can generate with these tiny molecules or tiny particles. or tiny cubes tiny materials so this is why nanomaterials become so 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 very important okay and uh, what happens with the properties we will talk about a uh, different properties later on in next classes because this class i will just keep it a brief overview because this is the first class uh, so when we talk about the 1 to 10 sorry 1 to 10 micrometer still we talk about the bulk properties uh, okay so mostly uh, the bulk properties dominate that side is right yes yes uh, ma'am uh, as you told that uh, from that 1 cm side cube we can generate uh, this amount of matlab uh, uh, nano surface areas so how do i uh, how do we yes. utilize that in the applications uh, Okay, so in the application area, you are talk talking about so, so computers. Have you seen? You have seen computers. All of us seen computers. So at the beginning, when at in the in the era of nineteen eighties, the computers were were bulky, right? it takes a huge space the memories uh, if you want to have talk about with advent of this nanotechnology basically the the micro uh, the uh, the microelectronics comes into play the semiconductors become more abundant or we can actually put everything in a microchip before i mean see look at the cell phones it becomes smaller and smaller right just because or thinner and thinner our you know uh, the um, you look at the televisions before it was a bulky one now we do have those uh, smart tvs which are basically uh, very very thin right they are this is possible because of this nanomaterial uh, you know uh, uh, creation as well as uh, tuning of their properties we will come to that does that answer your question or thank you ma'am i got my answer okay thank you so we will talk about those applications later on but let me just go through niche diye chole jao and bend okay Okay, let me just go through uh, what happens to the properties in terms of the uh, general terms. Actually, if you look at uh, the size range at around one to ten micron, still we talk about the bulk properties. Okay, in the micrometer range, we do have bulk properties. Whatever the normal physics told us, we all the laws and all the uh, calculations hold hold goods uh, in micrometer range. But when you go to 
100 nanometer, less than 100 nanometer, the surface energy dominated properties become more prevalent. What are those? We will look at later on in, in next classes, not in these classes, but why it is so, we will look at in the next slide itself. But if you go below, sorry, this is not 100 nanometer, but this is basically 2 to 4 nanometer, okay? So if you go beyond 2 to 4 nanometer, the quantum effects comes into play. As I mentioned, why this happens? Basically, if you look at the fraction of surface atoms uh, with dimension in the nanometers, if you plot this, that means how many atoms are basically sitting on the surface compared to how many atoms are present in the bulk. So if you just look at uh, what does that mean? If I may just show you something, if you look at this structure, that's the structure below. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Okay. So if you look at these structures, so these are the surface atoms that we can see, but inside it, there are so many, uh, you know, uh, atoms are present uh, inside these shells basically if you look at this table the total number of atoms these are seven shells cluster we are talking about over here and it does have 14 15 number of atoms whereas only 35 percent of the atoms are present in the surface okay so whatever is there on the surface is known as surface atoms and inside the surface inside the uh, bulk material those are known as the uh, you know uh, bulk, bulk atoms, okay? So basically, if you talk, if you just see this figure over here, uh, which so shows the fraction of surface atoms, uh, how it is changing with dimension in nanometers, then you will see that if you look at, let's say, uh, one micron, okay? What happens? Okay, we will go, go ahead with this one micron and we get to know how many surface atoms so 0.1 percent of the surface atoms are present in a material so we can ignore it right 99 percent are bulk material so the bulk property prevalent in micrometer which but if you go to 10 nanometer okay let us just go to 10 nanometer and check what happens Now look at the number of fraction of surface atoms present in a material if we go for 10 nanometer uh, particle. 10% of the atoms, total atoms are present in basically the, at the surfaces. What does that mean? That means in this region, you cannot ignore the effect of surface atom because at the surface, if you just look at, if you just talk about very, very simple one, okay? I know this is the end of the day and uh, all of you are tired. But still, if you just look at the forces, if you talk about the, you know, uh, the bulk atoms and the surface atoms, how it looks like. Okay? So let me just draw this. These are, let us consider this. These are the water molecules. And this is the surface of the water molecule. Okay, so when we are talking about the uh, when we are talking about the bulk material or bulk atoms, the forces acting on different particles are present in each way, right? It is homogeneous in nature. It might be heterogeneous, but it is even evenly distributed. But if you look at the surface forces or if you look at the surface atoms, these are the like atoms, uh, either repulsion or attraction. But there is a, uh, I mean, uh, imbalance of the force from this atom with the atom at the air. If you are thinking about, we don't have anything rather than air. So there, there is a kind of an imbalance of forces that will take takes place and that basically generates or that uh, uh, actually uh, 
give rise to a surface energy okay we will talk about it uh, later on also in our courses because we will talk about the forces what are the forces and how they are uh, the surface energy basically comes into play but this is the basics of surface energy here there is no force imbalance whereas at the surface uh, if you look at the surface atoms there is force imbalance which actually creates the surface energy uh, or which is the cause of surface energy now obviously uh, here because we cannot ignore surface energy so that's why most of the property are surface energy dominated properties what are them obviously we will look for it later on uh, now what happens in the 2 to 4 nanometer range because i said if you go beyond 2 to 4 nanometer range we are almost in this region over here almost all of the atoms that are present are at the surface almost 100 percent are at the surface okay so what happens in that particular case is rather than having a surface energy dominated properties we go ahead with the quantum effects and uh, why it is so it comes from the band energies uh uh, uh and uh, probably you know better than me uh, with uh, for this uh, how it works but we will try to look at uh, very briefly what happens at the band, band energy scale, uh, level and uh, why this quantum effect does uh, plays you know uh, a pivotal role in two to four nanometer square uh, less than two to four nanometers right now uh, this is also very interesting uh, that's why i put it put up put it up over here uh, just to give you a context of this figure is, is uh, uh, this is kind of a, a, the shell clusters, okay? So if you are considering a, a FCC and if you cluster it, uh, the, the smallest possible FCC which is having most of the surface atoms is, is possible with one shell uh, cluster and uh, where total 13 atoms are present and 92 of them are basically 92 percent of them are actually basically surface atoms okay uh the face centered uh, uh, uh cubes uh, if you if you remember if you cluster three of three shells together you have 147 atoms and 63 persons of surface atoms and so on that's how you goes around with seven cell structure you have have 14 15 whereas only 35 percent of them are, are surface atoms so as you go on moving from uh no. seven cell structure means or shell crushers to lower shell and if you look at the percentage of atoms in the divided by on the surface and the, hello can you hear me Yes, ma'am. Somebody said something. Yes, ma'am. Uh, seven cell structure means. Oh, okay. Seven cell structure means basically you you do have uh, uh you know uh this is kind of a rhombothrombic structure actually if you can think of and you do have uh kind of a uh you know um you put uh, how do i call uh um if you put uh, like uh, uh 
how do I put to, put it together? Uh, you saw like uh, it is not exactly the um, uh, the rubric cubes, but You know, if you go on increasing the structure, I mean, by one by one, and then you will actually end up of getting this this kind of uh, structures. Like, uh, if, do, do you uh, do you know what is what fullerene is? Fullerene is a classical example of this uh, shell um, structures actually. <laughs> Okay, so that kind of like you put together seven shells together and you go ahead and you get this kind of structure. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Okay. So this is the uh, surface atom with particle size basically decreases, whereas the bulk atom basically increases with, uh, uh, you know, uh, atoms in bulk with the, uh, with the uh, surface. Okay. Now, this is the interesting part that you might be interested in a bit. Uh, although, again, I'm not going into the details of it. I have just put it together in this form over here. So, if you are covering the density of states, uh, then you will get the density of states uh, with this, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, structure. Okay. So, this is E versus this is basically DE density of state and then you will obtain this kind of uh, graph whereas if you go ahead with the 2D quantum well you will obtain this staircase type of energy of state and if you go ahead with 1D quantum well you will obtain this discrete kind of you know a uh, wave kind of uh, uh, energy of state whereas for quantum dots you will obtain basically discrete energy bands or density of states in this particular case in in zero d dimension what is zero d i will come to that later on uh, in the next slide itself in the zero d basically electrons are fully confined whereas 2D and 1D, electrons confinement and delocalization coexist, whereas electrons are fully delocalized in terms of, in case of 3D. That's why you'll obtain this kind of a continuous function, whereas you get a staircase kind of a function in case of, uh, you know, the wavelet structure in quant uh, 1D quantum waves. And this straight line, discrete lines uh, of energy states for uh, zero D quantum dots. Now these are the uh, equations for uh, the uh, equation of state. Basically, number of electrons they, that are um, that can actually conduct current, and uh, or that can basically uh, you know yeah that can conduct basically which are conductive in nature and this is the Planck's constant m is the mass of the electron l is the length of confinement then nx ni nz are the uh, quantum uh, numbers uh, in xyz directions and obviously from these e e equations we get the uh, the number of electrons that are conducting and from there from the total number uh, we get dn de uh, from there that, that's why, how we get the energy of state and uh, or density of state and from there we get this kind of uh, you know uh, graphs okay so if you want to read more about it uh, probably i will not talk much about it uh, later on also in my class but if you want to go ahead and read uh, there are so many good books available i can give you some notes as well uh, if those who are interested in it because uh, from this actually we will later on you will see there are uh, although there are electronic properties there there are, we will talk about also um, the optical properties. We will talk about mechanical properties as well. Uh, 
but uh, this is very very important in for uh, inanimaterials but this is basically what we are talking about over here is electronic properties we will talk about a bit in detail in the next class probably but uh, why i just bring this up over here just to give you an idea about uh, how the uh, energy density of states looks like for different kinds of nanomaterials. But we have talked about this 3D, 2D, 1D, 0D. Uh, we still don't know what does that mean, OK? So let us just go ahead and do some classification of nanomaterials. And they are basically depends on uh, how many dimension <coughs> I'm not in the nanoscale okay the nanomaterials are classified based on the dimension uh, and the dimensions which are not in the nano range sorry <clears throat> so so basically when we are talking about uh, zero dimension that is zero d we are talking about the quantum dots uh what are quantum dots probably you were you know better than me again uh but uh, when we are talking about the zero d mostly the nanoparticles which are having a diameter less than 100 nanometer also falls into this uh category but to be very frank whenever we talk about zero d mostly we talk about quantum dots, okay? So quantum dots falls under 0D. That means all the dimensions of the nanomaterial are less than 100 nanometer. Now, what is then 1D? 1D is either of X, Y, or Z. Either of them are not in the nano range. So suppose you do have nanowares like carbon nanotubes or nanorods or uh, nanowares, they fall into this category. They might have a diameter less than 100 nanometer, but the length might be in micrometer range. Okay, so that basically or length might be more than 100 nanometers that falls into the category of 1d and we actually term the nanowares nanorods nanotubes are in this category itself now obviously what happens with two-dimensional uh you know uh nanomaterial so 2d nanomaterials are those nanomaterials uh in which one of the length scale that is either xyz are in nanometer range, one of the length scale. Other two length scales are not in nanometer range. Then that basically is termed as 2D. And nano coatings, nanofilms basically falls into this category. Okay. Now, obviously, someone may ask me, ma'am, then what happens to 3D? Because 3D then uh, we cannot term it as nanometrics. It will be a bulk material, it will be a micro material, or it will be uh, something else. So why we are actually considering a 3D nanomaterials? What does that mean? 3D nanomaterials is something like, uh, suppose you put like uh, uh, two different material, nanomaterial together, fuse it together and try to make a composite, okay? Although none of the length scales falls into the nano region, but still we term it as 3D nanomaterials because they are composed of nano, mostly the nanocrystalline materials and nanocomposite materials falls into this category. Okay. Is it clear what happens to 3D nanomaterial? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So basically, this is a broad classification of nanomaterial. Uh, I mean, we have to do some classification. That's how uh, with the size range, they have done a classification according to this. But mostly, uh, uh, 
in the next class, probably we will see that uh, how these nanomaterials can be made because you will uh, later on see that either uh, because the whole idea of nanomaterial being from Richard Feynman's uh, I, uh, talk, if you are talking about, uh, then they were uh, thinking about making something uh, which are very tiny. That means they are trying to put together the, the molecules uh, or molecule by molecule or atom by atom in order to make this nanomaterial possible. Okay, this is one of the approach which is known as bottom up approach. We will talk about this uh, in the next class uh, in detail, basically. And there is another approach. Suppose we do have uh, like, uh, uh, you know, a big material, as I was mentioning, a big cube. Okay, a big cube. And then we were trying to basically break it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then we obtain a tiny cube of, say, one nanometer in uh, size. Okay. So this approach is basically known as a top-down approach. Most of the mechanical machining or mechanical, uh, you know, um, hammering or like uh, uh, mechanical uh, ways of creating nanomaterial are top-down approach method, whereas most of the chemical approaches are bottom-up approaches, where we are synthesizing uh, uh, nanomaterials from the from the molecules or the atoms, okay? We will talk about it later on. Just to give you a very wide glimpse about the areas where the nanomaterial is presently being applied. Uh, I mean, although I have said, I have get only this figure, this picture from internet, this, I have not created it, but believe me, there are so many other application areas other than this. Okay, so uh, let me start with some uh, construction, smart cities, yes, consumer goods, um, sunscreens are no more white, they are transparent, thanks to titanium dioxide, thanks to nanotechnology for that, uh, our toothpaste, our, uh, I mean, you talk about anything and everything actually falls over here. In, in, in the consumer goods. Uh, agricultural and food, there are a whole lot of applications of uh, nanotechnology and nanomaterials in this particular field of applications. Um, energy sources, obviously, I mean, uh, this is some, something, this area is something which is presently being widely, you know, um, researched area and uh, environmental protection obviously now we are talking about the carbon carbon dioxide capture and different flue gas captures all these things basically falls into this area healthcare uh, i was mentioning about nano robots which can do our operations uh, and in the future probably we don't need uh, any doctors uh, those nano robots will do almost all of the uh, surgeries and we probably don't we will probably won't need any, uh, you know, other than uh, removing some parts, larger parts of the body, like appendicides or anything, stones like that. Other than that, probably all the uh, surgery will be done by nanorobots and uh, the drug delivery, therapeutic uh, 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 and there's a huge application area uh, where which has been actually um, come up in last decade, I would say, not even 20 years, last decade, it has boomed uh, in the healthcare uh, area. Uh, biomedical research, again, it is mostly related to drug delivery and uh, there are, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, also we do have... Uh, uh, 
you know, uh, nano labs, something like that, where we can actually create some molecules within a missile. So those kind of ideas came from this biomedical research. Electronics and machines, uh, you have plenty of application areas, like, as I was mentioning, microelectronics, photo, uh, photonics, then uh, uh, in, in terms of machines, you have so many uh, applications areas, almost everywhere you can find the uh, nanomaterials. And another very important application area, which is not covered over here, is basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you consider, uh, most of, it is mostly the, uh, the uh, clothing, uh, but it is for, you know, uh, defense application. So uh, you have seen there, there are uh, uh, uniforms which actually can uh, bulletproof jackets, right? Nowadays, these bulletproof jackets are becoming more and more lighter so that soldier, soldiers can actually carry them for a longer time as well as more and more harder, harder to penetrate and because thanks because to the nanometrial inventions. Okay, so there are plenty of applications. We will talk about some of the applications in details uh, because you are from mostly from mechanical and IEEE. So we will talk mostly about some electronic. Uh, we talked about the lab on a chip, right? We are in an era of, uh, you know, uh, carbon nanotubes mostly. We are not even in the era of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology has been on already, uh, uh, a past thing probably we are in a mostly we are on on an era of uh, carbon nanotubes now and uh, we will actually find a whole lot of applications of carbon nanotubes in different parts of the spectrum of the uh, society uh, even i forgot to mention in when uh, when we are talking about again it is mostly in, uh, materials uh, related, but we talked about the solar panels, right? Now, because of the uh, uh, efficiency of these semiconductors become uh, more and more, uh, these solar panels are become cheaper and cheaper. And with the advent of quantum dots, we will be able to actually reduce the cost furthermore. And uh, mostly nowadays, if you look at any of the solar panels, uh, those pan solar panels which are actually fabricated with quantum dots are mo more cheaper as well as more efficient. And that is why uh, this uh, zero D, what we talked about before, this zero D, uh, you know, is very become very, very important in all our applications. But Again, I'm saying it categorically. If you take any of these things, like, okay, just let me give you an example of uh, take a car, okay? You touch any portion of the car, you have an technology application. You talk about the, we talk about the windshields, let us consider it. Uh, on the windshields, you find that nowadays on the cars, there are not much, uh, you know, uh, dust, dust can, dust are sticked together, sticked on the surface of the uh, windshields. That is because mostly a, a self-cleaning coating has been actually uh, put on top of the glass. And that's how they actually reduce the amount of dust particles that can accumulate on the surface. Uh, how it looks like uh, in, uh, in, in nanometer range, we will, all, we will see all of them in the next class. So uh, that is it for today. Uh, thanks for your attention. And if you have any doubts, you can tell me. Uh, Ma'am, along with the lectures, do you suggest any book? Yes, I will. Uh, I will actually uh, upload that book in the, uh, you know, uh, most of the most of the materials I have taken from that book, basically, uh, this book basically known as uh, is, uh, uh, Michael Ashby's book. It is uh, basically uh, nanomaterials, nanotechnologies, and design. Okay, uh, by Michael F. Ashby for this part only. 
only for the nanomaterials part, but we will not go much detailed about nanomaterials because this course is mostly about the surface engineering and colloids. So we will try to get uh, some glimpses of nanomaterials and we will just uh, shift towards uh, the colloids and surface engineering. But uh, I thought it will be very interesting for you to see some examples. Uh, in the next class, we will show you some examples of nanomaterials and there you, you can find it very, very interesting. So that's why. Ma'am, uh, on, the, on the class. Ma'am, you will give us all the notes in like PDF yes. format or what, whatever. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, I will give. It, it will be sufficient for your exams. Whatever the notes are. But I can't give Thank you the video lectures, but we don't have uh, the options available at the moment. Okay. Other than video lectures, all the, all everything I will give. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention, and let me know if I can shift this class to somewhere else. Uh, if not, I will just take it as it is. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. See you in the next class. Then.